Welcome to Butterflies of Wisdom, everyone. This morning, I have third-time guest, Crystal Oliveira, with me, and she and I have decided to do a three-part episode. For those of you who completely missed part one, I'll stick that in the show notes of this episode, but she has saved thousands and thousands and thousands of families, and I'm even getting smarter about my college finances because of her wisdom. So she has saved thousands and thousands of families about sending their kids to college without going broke and without stressing out. And so I'll give you guys an update on my college journey later today. But we, uh, Crystal and I, are going to talk about you now have graduated college. You now have to pay off those Stedford Stafford loans. And what are you going to do about it? This episode will be geared towards the disabled and equal opportunity in climate, but I'm sure Crystal will throw a tidbit for the able body in there, too. So without further ado, I'm going to let Miss Crystal take it away. Awesome. Thank you for having me back as a guest. I really appreciate it. You are so welcome. So, okay, we have now graduated college. We have got to clear of our dreams which is one of the things I forgot to mention in the intro, you help people, able-bodied people and the disabled, find the career of their dreams. And so they don't have to go do the Monday blues every single morning and do, why do I have to go to work to a job that I don't like? So now we have graduated college, we've got the career of our dreams, but Yike was still trying to pay off the staff and loans that were given to us in college, and we only had six months. So now, what do we do? What do what does a disabled person do, and what does an able-bodied person do? Help us, Crystal. That's a great question. And I actually find the answer pretty interesting that both the abled and disabled need to do the exact same thing in terms of you need to start looking for a job prior to graduating college. You don't want to wait till the very end because then you have a lot of pressure that builds up. And the best way to do that is to start networking early in advance prior to graduating and just keep a running list of who would you like to work for and why. And the more you know about a company and the people they serve and what their mission is, the easier it's going to be to get an interview and to be able to impress them during the interview process. Well, luckily with my new career and my new associate degree, my career often needs to enhance my skills on this podcast if I want it or do freelance writing, or just publish books if I wanted. So for me, I don't necessarily have to go look out for a job, but a job helps with not only monetary, but a job helps with social stimulation, if you know what I mean, for anyone. And so, but I think that more and more, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think that more job applications are saying, do you actually have a disability? And you have to say, yes, I do. Or they say it's voluntary, but um, I tend to say, yes, I do. And my job now knows that I have a disability. They actually knew it for several years. So I'm still open. But for those who are not so open about their disability, what should we do when it comes to employment? That's a great question. Um, every application that I've personally applied to, I've seen that, especially on the larger employers. Sometimes with the small employers, um, their forms aren't 
standardized. But I know as you start moving into the larger employers, typically they all are. And because they don't want to get sued, they do ask questions about a disability. I have seen employers hire people with disability. I've worked with people with disabilities. And I think a lot of it is just your ability to talk about what your disability is and be comfortable about it. If you come off as, oh, I'm not as good as someone else, then the employer is going to feel that. And they're going to think, well, what else then we got like, aren't problems. you as good at? If, versus, yeah. if, yeah, you if say, you're good at oh, my disability is holding me back, the clients don't see that, and that's going to be a red flag that you could kick it off. No, I'm sorry, but let's be honest. Yeah, no, absolutely. Versus if you're, again, a good advocate for yourself and able to say, yes, this is my disability, but and you have a story to tell about how you've been able to overcome challenges or what you need in order or you're clear about what types of things you can and cannot do or what type of modifications you need, or ask the employer and be able to explain, maybe I'm not able to bend over and pick this amount of weight up, or I can only do it with this or this. The more clarity you're able to provide about what you can and cannot do and why, then the more the employer is going to be able to see, okay, is this critical to the job? If not, maybe I can give that one particular job duty out of a list of maybe 10 to someone else. And they feel comfortable knowing that they're still hiring someone who's able and capable of working. They're not discriminating. But they need to be under, be able to clearly understand what your needs are. And you need to be able to clearly communicate what your needs are. And I was going to say, a lot of states now have vocational rehab. Vocational rehab not only helps with college, but they help with finding jobs. So um, in my case, they wanted to know what my life goal was, and I said my life goal is to be a freelance journalist and um, a podcast, and they said, okay, that's what we're going to work on with you, and um, and I'll give you an update on that later today. But um, that process, but if you don't ask about Zoke Rehab, you're not going to get any help. And within these colleges now, they have um, not only classroom services, but I know with my college, the Academy of Arts in San Francisco, they have high-level people coming to take students out for a job in the arts and in fashion retail management. Yes. And just to add on to what you were saying about you want to be a freelance writer, and here's the thing, like regardless of whether you're going for a traditional route of employment where you're looking for 40 hours or part-time or freelancing, it's still a good idea to start looking and making a list of what's out there. And, like, for you, it's like, okay, you want to be a freelance writer. Let's make a dream list of who do you want, where do you want your articles to appear in? You know, what either online magazines, blog posts, print posts. um, I know there's a lot of fashion channels available in terms like YouTube. People have their own fashion channel. Where do you want to appear? Because that's going to give you guidance as to, When you make a big list, you might find out, well, some of these people you might not connect to, you might not want to write for because it's not the right audience. They might be too young or too old or you don't click with them or that's not really what you're passionate about. And even by doing that, you're still prospecting about future employment because you're looking at what's available in the market, what's going to be a good fit for me, and then you can make an action plan of how do you move forward with that. That's awesome to me and I um, today I actually get off the phone call I'm actually going to take Crystal's advice and open up a Google Doc and make a list and do all that and I think able bodied people should do the same thing because so then you can find your dream job mm-hmm. and, and then once you get to that point where you have a list then I would start following them on social media and just see what are they doing? How do they like to communicate? Because some, um, I know like online platforms will say we're looking for a guest appearance 
or we're looking for a guest blog post. And there might be a whole bunch of key words that they use to describe we're looking for a guest, a guest writer, or um, something like that. And if you see how often they include a guest, then you, you get a better feel for what are your chances of being able to write for one um, company versus another. If you see one that maybe half their content is them and half their content is from guests, then you know you're going to have a higher probability of being able to be featured because you see that that's part of their natural business versus someone else or another company who may never have a guest or they might only have a guest occasionally or one or two guests throughout the entire season, you know your chances aren't going to be as good. And once you understand how each company works, then you're going to be able to better position yourself as, okay, well, what's my strategy? Exactly, exactly. So the power of social media, my God. So um, the power of LinkedIn, the power of Facebook, the power of Twitter, I mean, LinkedIn, I was just um, interviewing a specialist on LinkedIn. That's all Christy Wayla focuses on. And LinkedIn is powerful as to say you do it the right way, you um, you do it the right way. And I think that college students should have LinkedIn because as part of the network, because even though the colleges are having job fairs, so to speak, LinkedIn is more powerful. I mean, they're asking kids nowadays in these jobs to manage LinkedIn profiles for the company, Facebook profiles for the company, Twitter profiles for the company, um, Instagram profiles. So you need the social media skills on your side. Yes, and a lot of employers are looking you up online to see what you're about because yeah. you're like, they might have several a candidates who are a good fit. And if they have one job position and 10 ideal candidates that all look good on paper and they're interviewing them and everybody's putting their best foot forward, they're going to turn to social media and look at, okay, well, who represents themselves well online? And yeah, they might I, use that as a – yeah, my way to decide who gets the job. The employer or employees follow you on Facebook and follow you on Instagram. I know a couple of employees at my current job now um, follow me on Instagram. The school has an Instagram account, so they follow me too. And it's like you have to not only put your thoughts down on paper, but make it good on Instagram because social presence is something that employers are looking at. And that's another good point, too, is when you're more involved with your school, like the different activities they have on campus, a lot of times they know that the school has relationships developed with different employers, and they have so many kids coming through their school that they can't recommend or refer everyone. But if you're actively involved in school programs, school clubs, being involved, you're on their social media commenting, liking, and sharing, then you develop a really good relationship with them. And they'll oftentimes give you really good advice about the employers in the market who's looking for something or how to represent yourself if you want to do freelance. And do most schools have, I know they have the student resource center, but could you go there and ask for employment in the right advice or no? So a lot of schools are different. They a uh, student resource center is pretty broad. Um, for some schools yeah. they'll have multiple departments. So I always start asking with do you have resources for employment or how to best prepare for employment. And then what will often happen is they might know of another resource on campus where they might say, like, no, we're here primarily focused for incoming freshmen, you know, to help them get to class. And they might have resources in case people are having um, emotional problems or disorders or, like, they, they 
usually cover a huge umbrella of challenges if people can't afford tuition and they're they're stressed out and they need to talk to someone about how to cope with the stress, that thing. Yeah. But they might refer you to someone else and say, you know, this is who you need to talk to. They specialize in, say, developing relationships with potential employers. Or what they like to do is they like to bring in guests speakers from other companies to talk about their companies, and it's probably a good idea that you go to these luncheons to learn about, you know, the services available and what they offer and to learn about what employers are looking for and new graduates. New graduates. Now, um, I'm going to phrase it this way because I kind of have a job coach now and kind of don't uh, because I know what I want. But how do you feel about job coaches for the disabled? Do you think they're doing a good job, or do you think we need to help them as a community? I like job coaches. Um, I think that the better you represent yourself, the more you're going to get out of a coach. And if you, you are I knew you were going to say that disability, I think you would probably get the most out of a coach who is also a dis- has a disability who's been there before you because you might have more challenges with someone who's not. Like, you might not feel like they connect or really understand you. They can still help you and they can still provide you. But if you can find someone who's been a step ahead of you or several steps ahead of you, you're probably going to connect to them more. And you're probably going to take their advice more seriously, which means you're probably going to take action and see more results. So you're saying that you should try and find a job coach who actually has a disability? Mm-hmm. Or a mentor. Gee, Pete, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Here I thought all these job coaches, see, I learned something. Yeah, I thought all these job coaches were um, focused on finding jobs. I didn't know up until about two months ago that they actually help with education stuff. But you're saying to the disabled audience out there that they should start looking for a non-abled body job coach because they have more... Um, compassion for your situation, even though they may not have the same disability, they do have more compassion for your situation. Right. And here's the way I look at it. Like, I absolutely love job coaches, but there's not one solution that fits everybody. And so in this whole spectrum, you might have job coaches who specialize in people who are in the middle of their career and they feel like they hit a plateau and they need to go to the next level, those people are going to have different challenges than someone who has a disability and maybe needs to do some role playing about how do I talk about myself during an interview and my disabilities. And there's very, even though they're both job coaches, you're going to get a lot more out of the person who understands your specific challenges and who can help you get to the next level. And oftentimes, it's someone who's been where you're at, they know how you're feeling, they understand the emotional challenges you might be struggling with about not feeling good enough, or how do I talk about it in a way where I can still demonstrate my value, even though I might not be able to physically be able to do a lot of the things. And there's also a lot of inspiration when you see someone who has a disability who's done it. It doesn't have to be the same exact disability as yours, but just knowing that they've had physical challenges, you know, that might be different than yours, but they've still been able to persevere and still been able to do well for themselves. Well, that's interesting that you say that. I'm actually going to send this um, interview to my um, to, to my job coach on the side notes because. She wants to listen to the podcast anyway. And so I'm actually going to give a heads up that I am more of a resource to helping her than she thinks I am. And so it's so funny you say that because I was 
reading an article about a couple of months ago about how we need more doctors and dietitians and in medical fields with disabilities, same thing, because they have compassion and they are inspiration for the disabled. Yeah. And I, I, again, I just, I think it's all about understanding your value because I can see you, even you wanting to give back to the community and being a coach or a mentor to others. That's also something that you can do because you're going through the challenges and you know what it's like and you've had to face them beforehand. And with your career coach, you can always position it as, you know, I would like to coach people on whatever topic you're passionate about. And it could be fashion. Like some people with disabilities have a hard time finding fashion that they feel comfortable with because maybe they want to cover certain parts of their body. You know, I know um, I've worked with people who were burned. And, you know, like parts of their body, they always, they're very particular about their fashion because they want to make sure that it won't slide off their shoulder and show part of their yeah. arm that was burned or whatever. And so I think that, you know, a coach, it depends on what do you expect to get out of a coach. If you're looking to build a practice and be a freelancer, then a coach could give you some good information about how do you build a practice, how do you make sure that, you know, you have a schedule where you're doing enough promotion and you're getting the word out about your book and your services and what is it that you do. So she might be a good career coach from that standpoint of helping you build a good practice. But, you know, on other things, she might not be able to connect with you as well as maybe someone else. So it depends on what are your expectations for a career coach? What do you want to get out of it? And when you know that, then that's what's going to be able to help you figure out whether or not someone's going to be a good fit for you. Well, um, as I said, you guys in the able to bond community may have to um, call your local career coach's office, which is 9 times 10, in the workforce center for able to body people looking for a job who are on and fight. And so it's in the back of the workforce center, at least minus. But you guys may have to call your job coaching center and say, how can I help you as an employer? Because right now, because it's government entity, they have a lot of patients that are, um, you need to find jobs, and they don't have the resources to find all these patients' jobs. So, as Crystal, as I said, as Crystal and I said, if you, as the perspective um, patient with a disability, walk in there as a strong advocate, knowing what you want, like I did, that it's gonna make their jobs a lot easier because they don't have to go walk through the steps with one more patient of what they can offer. Yes. Anytime you can make their job easier, they're going to be more willing to help you <laughs> because <laughs> yes. I look at it this way. I mean, they might have a quota where they need to have so many clients or they need to help so many people. And so, you know, if they need, if their goal is to help, you know, X number of people per day and they only have a 20-minute slot per person, if you only have 20 minutes, they might spend most of that time trying to figure out what your disability is and what you can and can't do. And that means there's less time to figure out where to place you or what resources are available. But if you come in and you can very clearly explain, this is my disability, these are my challenges, this is what I can do and what I can't do and how I can provide value, then what happens is now they have the majority of that time slot to be like, great, I clearly understand your situation. Let's move beyond the diagnosis part of me trying to understand it. And let's spend that time focusing what opportunities are going to be a good fit for you that I have coming up now or in the near future. And you make the job so much easier, and then they can help you better. Then I can help me, and then I can help me or the other person, and and then – it makes the job so much easier. Then they don't walk in saying, oh, God, I asked for help this person again. Here we go with 
the unclear advocacy, I don't want to help this person. Although they may rumble that underneath the bus and put a big smile on, but the less you're willing to help them, the more stressful it is on the golf course. Let's be honest there. And it's more stressful on the financial advisor and school, and it's more stressful on the student support services. And so it doesn't make anyone feel good if you don't want the uh, advocate for yourself. So where can the people find you, and how can people get a hold of you if they want to know more of what you do? And as I said, I'll put part one and part two in part three so you guys can hear it if you guys just um, click over to the show notes then a link will be in the show notes to part one and part two and so where can people find you Crystal, if they want to get a hold of you and then you can ask me two to three questions about equal opportunity and employment after you say where can people find you? Okay. So they can find me on my website at careerconversationalist.com. You can also connect with me on social media on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Google+. Plus. And you can either type in my name, Crystal Oliveria, or type in Career Conversationalist. Okay? Yeah, so and when you type in okay. Conversationalist, you'll pop up. Yes. Um, okay, Wynn, so I know you've done uh, several interviews for a job position. So what kind of questions do employers ask you about your disability with cerebral palsy? They they asked me, um, well, when I got this job that I have now, I actually found this job on my own, and I found it just basically laying my bike, and I um, kind of convinced my boss at the time to – can we give me a job? Although I did ask, do you have any openings? They saw my disability because I was a student at uh, David Spark. the private school that I work now. So they saw my disability. And what ends up happening is they ask that um, what can you physically do and what can you physically not do? So that's my that's my little speech on that. But nine times out of ten, when, as we said, most forms are different, and most forms are different, and most forms are the same, of what equal opportunity employers will ask. What kind of accommodations do you need, and have you found uh, employers being willing to make? I need, well, I need my book on Kindle. I need chairs in the classroom. And nine times out of ten, I'm sitting on the riser. So this is not adult-sized chairs in the classroom for preschoolers. So, no, they don't make that accommodation. I wish they did. But um, I wish that they would see Equal opportunity in players is a good thing. I think it's, I think it's on the right, right, but we still have to teach them. And then do you happen to have any programs or apps that you like to use that you find are helpful for people with disabilities? Oh, I like Siri that comes right out of the box on the iPhone and Siri comes on Apple iPad and Siri comes on um, Apple Macintoshes and the iPhones, and I like Dragon Naturally Speaking, both for the PC and for the Apple. So that's a speech to the education program for those of you that don't know that. Can you give the listeners and the audience an example of how you might use Siri, for example? Well, I use Siri to write my book and to write every note on the planet. I mean, I just type in what I just dictate what I want to say and open up a notepad and nine times out of ten, still I get to write. 
So I hope you guys enjoyed another fabulous episode with Crystal and I. And as I said, I'll put um, Crystal's information plus the other interview link. And you guys will catch me later talking about more assistive technology with David. But I will catch you guys later, and I hope you guys enjoyed another fabulous episode. Thanks, you guys.